Okay, I'll start us off. I'm Clive Kilnot, so I'm Professor of Design Studies here for my sin as I teach a um, thesis <laughs> on transdisciplinary design. So I see the uh, I see the pain of trying to be a transdisciplinary designer. Um, I love the fact that the title has got failure in it. I didn't know if that was the case, but that's always good too. Focus us really not on successes, which we don't have really many, but failures we do. So there's more to talk about. Um, what we're really asking about here is, uh, as I put it in my own little notes and my notes to the class, how does transdisciplinary, how does it kind of survive outside of practice, outside of past? Can it survive? What does it do? wither and die. <laughs> what does practice mean here? Um, and to some extent too, that might also be a reflection on, in fact, as one understands from the perspective of practice, what the hell transdisciplinary design was that you were educated into, or whether it, how that changes. And really we look at this general question through two kinds two related questions, one which starts in practice and one which goes a wee bit further. The first one is to look at this relationship between visibility and invisibility in TransD practice. In other words, how much does TransD have to announce itself? Or can it kind of slip underneath, as it were, slide underneath? Can the designer be content with almost effacing him or her? I always said years ago that we should have a BFA in, in, in invisible de design just because the degree show would be so good. <laughs> Everybody could just stand around having a d d drink. You wouldn't need to look at the ready work. <laughs> good. So can design, can in a way trans turn this to actually positive account in some way or does it actually need that determination? The second related question here was that to look at this relationship between design, transdisciplinarity, and politics, this three-way <coughs> relationship, and particularly to ask perhaps in what way can transdiscipline and transdisciplinarity or transdisciplinary design be a kind of mediator. And by design here and politics here, we can mean it both literally and figuratively. Design can stand for change, as politics can. So how does transdisciplinary transdisciplinarity mediate between modes of change? Modes of kind of the act of changing, which we call designing, and in a sense, the desired consequence of change, which we call politics in a way. So the existing to preferred situations of urban assignment. So how does the design deal with that? So the point was to give each of these guys, five minutes, which means probably more than five minutes, because we all would need, or always need more than five minutes to, if you like, reflect on these conditions. Um, they will perhaps end each of their talks with a little provocative question, which goes both to the panel, to me, to you, and then we'll see what happens out of this, we'll see what evolves. I have no idea, frankly, what will evolve, if anything at all. <laughs> we have to finish at exactly 10.40, I have to go to teach. Ironically, it's a seminar on design and politics, so I shall take these ideas and go to teach them. It's immediate application. <laughs> okay, take it away, whoever wants to start. Hey everyone, uh, so my name is Aya and I graduated last year from Francis Design Program. Uh, and I'm, I try to write at four in the morning, uh, and organize my thoughts and perceptions and reflections on the program uh, a year out um, to the best to the best of my abilities because I think I'm still reflecting on what it means to be a transdisciplinary designer. Um, so I'll try to touch upon what transdisciplinary design is to me uh, at this point in life and how it acts in the world through my work uh, at IDEO.org um, and how it fails regularly. Um, as a transdisciplinary designer, I feel like I design within the invisible every single day, and as a designer, I fail every single day. And if you stay with me for a few more minutes, I'll try to explain how I am completely fine with this situation. 
the way that I think design operates is within the intangible and the invisible spaces. Uh, it's in the nooks and the crannies, on the edges, and in between the written, the felt, and the seen, and the unseen. Uh, especially so when it is transdisciplinary in nature. Whereas designers in the past had a blind faith in the ex their expertise and their design, the capital D, I think designers today, transdisciplinary designers particularly, must retain some of that faith, not out of blindness, but also uh, out of farsightedness. So I think that we should understand that the attempted change and impact of our design work isn't necessarily to be measured uh, in numbers, or at least not entirely, uh, revolve around numbers to prove success or scale of the projects that we do. Uh, any change, be it social, economic, political, or personal, takes uh, place across a multiplicity of layers of human and non-human existence, spread over shifting periods of time. And sometimes it comes uh, jolting like the socio-political revolution or personal epiphany, and other times it happens very slowly as we mature and morph uh, individually and as a society. So to explain this far-sighted faith that keeps me going, I'll talk a little bit about a project that I did uh, with my team at audio.org. Um, and it, it's the nonprofit Arno Audio, and we basically straddle between the design world and the nonprofit world every day. One of the projects that I think represents the far-sightedness that I believe in as, as a designer was the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Um, and the organization that we worked with um, was started by a woman from Jordan who saw that there was a, a, a problem in the Middle East, which is that uh, children, Arab children, don't focus on reading for pleasure. We read a lot um, for school, for education, science, religion, all those things, but we don't actually read for pleasure. Uh, I grew up in the Middle East, my family but it was an anomaly. We read for pleasure all the time, but that was not the norm around us. And so this woman uh, started a reading circle in her neighborhood. She would um, gather uh, kids from the neighborhood in a public space, sometimes in parks, sometimes in someone's home, and they would read to the children. Uh, and the children get to take a book with them back home uh, and bring it back to next week and together again and again and again. And so her idea with us was to uh, take that model and apply it to the Zephyr camp in Jordan for the refugee children. Um, now, there's many benefits to uh, creating those reading circles. Uh, some of them are much more obvious. There's a sense of community that the children get to experience. Reading uh, helps improve your cognitive abilities. Uh, you empathize with the characters that may be very different from you, uh, and you then start empathizing with people in the real world. Uh, it ignites your imagination, and, and in a refugee camp setting, you can imagine how imagination and imagining uh, a different world could be beneficial to the psyche of the children. Um, but that's, obviously that's not enough. Um, the project spoke to me on many different levels personally because of what I told you about growing up in the Middle East, and I absolutely lo loved working on it. Um, however, this is where I think that we fail daily as designers. Uh, there's often, even in this project, whenever I finish a project at, at IDEO.org, I feel a profound sense of failure every single time. Um, the smallness and the insignificance of the project that I do overshadows all the work that we've done. Uh, in some ways, every design project I believe that we put out into the world is a failure. But I believe in the collective ability of all of our projects to have some kind of impact together, uh, not by themselves. So by addressing a certain issue, with your design, um, because I think you have to address a certain issue. If you want to design, you have to set some parameters and ask a specific question. And by framing that question, you're, you're isolating all of the other uh, multiplicities of existence around that question. Um, and so you create criteria and you design within them, and you are somehow willfully entering a space of blindness. For for example, in the case of the reading circle in the Zephyr again, um, there's all the positive impacts that I just talked about, but also we're not addressing the fact that the children actually need actual schools to go to so that they could uh, progress within the society and the societal st structure that we've built in the world. <coughs> we're not addressing the fact that, uh, that people need to actually exit uh, refugee camps and not stay within the refugee camps. Um, and so I believe strongly in, um, in the value of reading on the imagination, on dreaming, and escaping far harsh realities. Um, but I also understand that 
that is not enough. Um, the parameters are limiting, and the kids still need the actual schools. So with the reading circle, we're kind of not addressing the actual issues, but we're tapping into some of the possibilities that um, could happen with design collectively. Uh, alone, it's not enough. Um, but together as a system, so if you think of the UNHCR schools that actually exist, the IKEA holding homes that exist there, the ARC and the IRC providing water and medical services, um, and there's other designed um, sort of interventions happening. Some of them are sweeping, like, uh, like governmental policies and actions. And sometimes uh, some of these actions that we do are they sit within the unseen and the intangible, like, for example, the imagination that you enact with the reading circle. So all of these exist within a system of multiplicities in that refugee camp, and together they could start to have an impact. Alone, they do not. Um, and this system perspective is what allows me to keep doing what I do every day, and I know that a system is not a flat diagram or an infinity map, it's an amorphous mess, a multiplicity of layers, and a collectivity of participants and designers. So this brings me to what transdisciplinary design is to me. And today, uh, I see transdisciplinary design from a, as a, an approach to, the, to design that pieces on design that tries to move design from a singular approach to a multiplicity of approaches. To design in a transdisciplinary way is to attempt to carve out spaces for others to fill in instead of filling in the space yourself, which is what I think designers use to try to do. Um, our human experience is never a single narrative with a beginning, middle, or end. It lays in fragments, in layers, and in moments, sometimes in solitude, sometimes in groups, physically, sensually, emotionally, mentally, all of these layers of existence. And when addressing this mosaic of systemic problems, we need to design systemic approaches that meet us across the layers. We need to design structures within which we produce ourselves and the society we live in. I think transdisciplinary design, secondly, is trying to move design from and designers from masters of a certain craft to master learners and listeners. Learners learning from each other, from other fields, and from the people who we design for and with. Um, it's about acknowledging our limits, the limits of the frames that we set up and the, the design criteria that we set up, but also acknowledging our limits of ability and our ignorance. I'm an empath to the nth degree, but I also had to um, acknowledge the fact that when I was in Manila in a slum working with the uh, inhabitants of that neighborhood, um, I could never empathize with the lady who lives in a slum, could never leave the slum because of her financial situation, and she lives directly on a fault line for an earthquake. Um, and she's stuck there because of finances. I can never understand her situation, but what I can do is um, as I listen to her, uh, she will always be the expert on her life, and I will always just be learning from her about her life. Uh, I could, I could, as a designer, my role for to design with her and for her is to learn and listen, so I can perhaps design a space for her that allows her to reach out to options and possibilities and solace through her difficult time. Um, and lastly, I think transdisciplinary design. My thoughts are not organized here. Um, tries to move design from solution-oriented to questions-oriented design. Um, so to say that there is a solution in our complex challenges uh, in this world is to be objective in a subjective world, and I think that's, I don't believe that that's something we can do. Um, I think transdisciplinary design in this case is about humility, which to me is a facet of, of invisibility, to be humble. Um, as we become transdisciplinarians and learn from, each other, from other disciplines like science and anthropology and others, um, we learn that these disciplines often ask questions without trying to give answers. Um, and while designers may not be the first you think of uh, to tackle these thorny issues in the world, I think that design actually that presents a really good case for design because design makes, makes questions tangible. Um, and only, only when, when, when we make um, visible that which is invisible, we actually begin to address it. So for all these cases, I. Um, think that it's a good time to be a transdisciplinary designer, and I welcome all the failures that we're having um, on a single day basis. So that's where I'm going to leave it off. Thank you.
Uh, we're, we're mostly working with social change NGOs and, you know, grassroots activists, movements, and basically using design and strategic design, um, <coughs> design thinking, no, I don't like calling it design thinking, but overall, you know, all these different realms of design that have gone beyond uh, the traditional design of the material. Um, and yeah, we're working with them, we're supporting their movements. And today, actually, what I want to talk about is um, a little bit about politics and design and transdisciplinary, that triangle that Clyde mentioned, but in the realm of collective action and, and movements, right? Organized action. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, first of all, because of my, my personal interests, which have to do with deeply collective experiences. I'm really interested in big systems um, like finance, right? Um, economics, like all of those systems have been what I've always been interested in, specifically um, since I have a background in game design and I'm just interested in the games and rules of our systems and how can I change them and how can I um, make them more flexible and, and start to see the systems as sandboxes that can be design or redesign or thought reimagined. Um, so I have always had this intellectual fascination with systems and with rules and with seeing them as, as sandboxes. And when I, when I came into design, I saw that as the opportunity to start going from being intellectually fascinated to actually inflicting some sort of uh, you know, change on them and, and trying to get my hand and changing them myself. Um, but it is now that I've started working at ThoughtWorks that I've also started thinking about what is the degree to which um, we have a space of action as designers. Um, and I'm gonna explain myself a little bit more with that. Um, so working at ThoughtWorks has been really interesting because my idea of what we do, of how we act as designers and, and the power that we have um, has shifted. Um, and I, I'm going to explain this a little bit. If we think about, you know, what is action in design versus activism, my experience of action in design has always been kind of like an orchestrated, uh, well thought thing where, where you do research first, right, or, or you try to observe and then you decide to go into like one thin slice of that, you do a prototype. Um, it's, of course, I, I also come at this from an academic um, you know, from the Santa Fe and et cetera, but it's almost like an academic, pro proactive action, you know, scientific method um, kind of thing. And also, you know, basically nested in, in, a, in a stability, in, in a corporate stability where inevitably we're the descendants of a line of design professions, right, that have been able to sustain themselves. Um, so I find that action in design, for some reason, has almost been like apolitical. We do have a set of values, but we, we say that we do prototypes for users or humans based in empathy, right? And the constraints come from the people, not from us. Um, and um, there's this mediation. There's kind of like the safe space between us and actions where what we're creating is mediators. We're creating materials. We're creating even services, right? I'm creating a mediation between the real world and, and people, and, and I'm in the safe space of action, whereas activism it's kind of, for them, it's a totally different world when it comes to how they act. Their whole life is a preparation because there, there's this space where it's, you're reacting, you're acting to something from, from a space of personal, uh, personal background, right? From things that have hurt you intimately, deeply. It's not like you can go and research. The empathy comes almost from yourself, right? You felt this pain. You've, been there, you feel it, you want to act against it. Um, they also tend to not be protected by corporate interests, not all the time, of course, if you look at philanthropy, but they come from a space where, you know, sometimes they can't make enough money. Um, so their action, their, their politics actually comes from a, a prototyping for ideals that are almost, you almost can't touch them, right? It's, it's based on an ideal that usually has to do with an ideology. Um, this is the ideal world, it won't change. And when I prototype for it, maybe I'll realize that something doesn't work well, um, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna change completely my ideal of the world. Uh, whereas in design, we're more like, you know, if there's a change, uh, if something didn't work out, that means we have to change because it's not <coughs> the world as is. 
So what's different in my experience um, has been an InDesign, we prototype and change and et cetera and pivot according to what works in the world as is, even if that implies giving up on the ideal ethical world, right, on the ideal, this ideal that we have. Uh, we're very much about the visible, right? Like what were the results of my action? What were the results of my prototype? Um, it's almost acceleration. Um, and activism on the other side, they, they do prototype too, meaning they realize what works and doesn't, um, but they don't necessarily change what they strive for. They never give up on that ideal ethical world. If you are a leftist activist and you believe in communism, you believe in communism, right? There's, there's almost like this, uh, they don't necessarily shift all the time. They might shift how they're getting there, but they have an idea of where they wanna go. Um, so going back to my original question, you know, what is action and design? What are the parameters of action? When I, when I put that against activism, I see that action and activism is a direct dialogue, like a right old, fearless dialogue with power structures. It's a direct dialogue. And, and I wonder how as designers we dialogue with power structures. Um, and transdisciplinary design, you know, in all fairness, I think that's actually what our program was trying to do, getting to a, a middle point where we can redefine action that pushes what's now, right? Um, well, keeping an eye on, on what could be in the most idealist of senses. We're always thinking about speculative design, about what society could be, we change absolutely everything, um, and then trying to make that actionable in the nowadays. Um, but in reality, and I think this is actually where uh, my work has taught me a lot, in reality, if, if we look at what happened with the election um, and, and with Trump, I'm gonna say his name though, it feels like Voldemort. Um, <laughs> uh, usually people try not to name him, right? Um, with Trump, uh, and this is my personal experience, but I, I, I felt like design was completely shell-shocked. Um, when activists got up and bought immediately with the tools that they already knew whether we thought we think they work or not, um, designers had uh, send newsletters citing always our uncertain political future, right? Trying to be like politically correct. Um, uh, we also had like healing salons, specifically at Trans D. We had a healing salon where everyone got up and sat together to talk about what was happening. We were all scared, right? Um, a lot of designers that I know that work in government didn't know what their futures were, were gonna be. Many of them even just decided to quit in mass. Um, and there was even a question in over personal safety, right, as designers. Um, and I think it was a wake-up call to the designers that I personally know, and again, you might have different experience, but it was a wake-up call of revealing that in many ways, the power that we thought we had seemed to be linked to an establishment. Um, and and it, I, that was hard for us to understand, right? We've had a pretty stable decade of, of growing this field. Um, more than that, of course, historically. But in the last decade, I think we've come to a point where we had designers in the administration, the Obama administration, right? It was like, everyone loves this. Um, and then this happened, and we have to look at ourselves, and, and we realize that we haven't looked at that invisible at, at what our idea world long enough. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that shell shock, that, that that moment where we realized that maybe we were part of a system and or that maybe we hadn't strived to, to assert ourselves in a political way and because of that now we were realizing um, that we are a part of a power structure and very much so. Um, now we, I actually see this as an opportunity, an opportunity for new openings, for new questions. Um, to start asking ourselves, you know, what is our role in proposing impossible worlds and making them possible more than in pivoting in the world as is? And um, should we own up to our progressive liberal practice and define it as such? Is it even so? Um, and I think this opens up to me what is the greatest fear if we start asking these questions personally, um, because I've been asking them myself as a part of my work with progressive movements, um, which is, you know, Okay, well, if my profession is progressive and liberal and our values of design, diversity, empathy, etc., uh, are all progressive and liberal, um, does this mean that there is a possibility for that to be co-opted by movements that we don't agree with? Um, just like 
you know, um, movements in the right, like the alt-right, have co-opted terms from the left, like safe spaces, triggering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if we are essentially a liberal progressive uh, profession, um, if there is space where eventually, by us not owning it, or owning it, I'm not sure yet, um, for, for spaces in the right that don't necessarily um, agree with what we're doing to co-opt that. Um, or, you know, if we do own it, will we realize that inside our own groups we have conservative, right-leaning people um, that can bring a different perspective to what we're doing as designers? Um, so I guess, you know, I, I wanted to leave it in a very, like, polemic stage for everyone, but I guess my main question after all my work and everything has become one that has made me panic a little bit, what, but it is, like, could design, design thinking, everything that we do here, uh, be used by by really extremist right leaning um, groups, um, and if so, how would we respond to that beyond saying, "Well, I empathize with my user, I value this and that." Um, so, yeah, that's basically where I'd like to leave it. We all graduated together. Um, over the last days, uh, we've heard many interpretations of this idea of invisibility. Um, we, we've heard about the silent epidemics caused by environmental pollution, um, optical saturation and blindness, the history of black bodies in America, the recent hyper-visibility of immigrants that collapses back into another kind of invisibility. The imperceptibility of molecules or fragments, the impossibility to comprehend climate change, the visible light spectrum, physiological limitations, cognitive biases. Within this nebulous universe of potential interpretation, there is one form of invisibility that I am particularly interested in those phenomena that lie before our very eyes yet remain unseen. What is foreclosed in any act of seeing? The photograph reveals the subject, but conceals that which lies beyond the frame. In this sense, how does our understanding of what exists depend upon how we see or what we choose to look at? How do we learn to see and how do our disciplines teach us to see? Furthermore, how do these concerns affect our experience of time, our sensibility, the way we relate to each other, or our ability to imagine a future? When I was working on my thesis, Clive said something beautiful uh, that I return to and I'll never forget. He said, we don't need new ideas we need new patterns for understanding the ideas we already have. It was one of those statements that was exciting to hear, yet I didn't fully understand it. I asked him what he meant by a pattern. Marxism, he, he exclaimed. <laughs> no, he self-corrected. More precisely, it was when Engels was traveling through England, studying the slums and factories of Manchester. Seeing what everyone else was seeing, the child labor, the degraded environment, the overworked and impoverished laborers, yet he was able to see it differently and he came up with a very different way of understanding what was happening, one that we continue to argue about and misunderstand to this day. But what does this have to do with design? Here, I hope you'll excuse me when I quote Foucault uh, <laughs> and his understanding of the archive, although I know Shannon will appreciate it. Uh, the archive for Foucault is what he calls a system of discursivity that establishes the possibility of what can be said. These books we keep, these books we throw away. And so we traditionally think of the archive as a kind of a, a collective repository of memory when in fact states used it to control what was remembered or what wasn't. 
Likewise, how might we understand design itself as a system of discursivity, which establishes the possibility of what can be said? In this sense, what questions is design capable of asking as that discipline which has emerged out of industry, something I know Clyde is very interested in? How might we develop a design pedagogy that addresses the underlying conditions of the discipline rather than its methods and rhetoric? And how might we articulate the value of this work beyond conventional market incentives or altruism? I noticed that nearly all of the design consultancies that I'm aware of never discuss non-action, preservation, or subtraction. Design is almost always an additive procedure because it is held accountable to a market that is necessarily generative. <coughs> there are very few people that would pay you to leave something be. This is why we see the need for grassroots land trusts like we were talking about yesterday. As designers, I do not believe that we can think our way out of this tension. We must reestablish the conditions out of which design has traditionally operated, be they economic, cultural, or social. What are we doing together in this room? It is a question that I ask my students because we rarely acknowledge that we are living lives. What is the force that compels us to sit together? Is it a common question or is it an overdetermined mix of overlapping concerns which push and pull against one another like you might find in a political rally? To quote Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, when I discover who I am, I'll be free. But perhaps there is also a freedom in continuously rediscovering who we are and what we are doing here. This is part of what drew me to the transdisciplinary design program. It is not service design. It is not interaction design. It is not industrial design. It affords the practitioner the agency to adapt it to their own practice and to respond to an evolving set of conflicts. It is an open sign. It is a D sign. Or to quote John Christopher Jones, it seeks to change the pattern of life free from the errors of specialization. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> the first thing I noticed about these three presentations is that work has had a wonderful effect on all three of the presenters. <laughs> <laughs> now, somehow, in the last year, have become infinitely more articulate than they were. <laughs> I know, you know, one suffers through student presentations, and I have suffered through a lot in my life. <laughs> These were considerably better, I assure you. They may not be perfect, but they were good. About as good as you're going to get. We're talking about recording, so it would be yeah. nice okay. to be spoken to the phone. Um, so that was, that's my first point. They have improved. <laughs> work works. <laughs> I take out of what we've just heard, and I'm going to be incredibly quick because I've just got a few minutes. I, I see three very strong elements coming out of this, and the three can kind of maybe play each other's points. The first was um, Aya's presentation, which I thought was incredibly honest about exactly the successes and failures of the designing. And it strikes me just how much from this, and there is of course inside this an ethics, uh, absolutely. But one of the learning processes for trans D design, for design in general, is that um, we need, as I've suspected, we need, need for a very long time, far more awareness of what failure and success means in the design. Design has always been has always been able to point to success and failure, and very, very, very rarely articulate it well. But it clearly here needs far more thought, and it needs far more thought because even what failure and success is is not certain. And it is clearly from what I took from what I am, what appears to be failure might be success, what appears to be success might be failure. How do we understand this, articulate this? How do we actually get much better at comprehending that which we actually do, let alone the process of doing it. The second point, which was, um, and is uh, extremely, I thought extremely useful, uh, contrast, sharp contrast between um, the designer's relatively conventional work 
um, and the and um, act of Buddhism, and the proposition that TD might be trans -D might be some kind of mediation between <coughs> these two, and just how important that might be now today. Um, in the process, not simply a mediation through what is, but a reconception of perhaps both elements. That is to say, at the moment, we find ourselves split between a kind of um, corporativism, to exaggerate on one side, and an activism occupy on the other. And it seems to me as if what we're actually beginning to see now is that both of those alternatives are actually false. They're inadequate that a different kind of relationship is made, I would say particularly, a different kind of relationship between the small scale and the large scale. How do we mediate those two? That which political activity, genuine political activity, and I mean, I mean by that problem that actual governance has to deal with, and it seems to be there. What Sam referred us to, and I think extremely, uh, again, rather, beautifully in his talk was the question of perception about comprehending the adequacy of the ways we comprehend the world, particularly the categorical structure in effect, I'm using categories in a wide sense now, of how we see the world, how we understand it. And he didn't, I think implied in that is the notion of, and I think this is do what designers are beginning to comprehend they can do, which is how the design <coughs> object, not necessarily a literal object, but the, the object of a designer's production, might itself become a lens, a way of exploring how we understand, also a self-reflexive exploration on the categories. And this puts the idea of designing itself as a way of actively understanding the world, not passively reflecting understanding, but becoming an active investigation and um, inquiry. There is a beautiful line from the Czech novelist Milan Kundera where he says at one point, he's answering a kind of rhetorical question, what is the ethics of the novel? And Kundera answers to himself, there's only one ethics of the novel, he says. The ethics of the novel is that it discovers some hitherto unforeseen aspect of human experience. And we could, I think, analogize that to design. Where design discovers hitherto unforeseen aspects of the world and our experience. So design is an active search into knowledge, not just the application of knowledge. So these three wonderful um, agendas are to be suggested by this. And now, throw it open to comments, both by the panelists, very briefly, they can have one comment each. <laughs> for questions before, five minutes before I run. And then you can all talk amongst yourselves. I, I, um, the only thing that I would mention is that I think one of the dangers that we have, I don't know if this has to do with that we're progressives or not, but one of the dangers we have nowadays um, with the rise of, uh, you know, fake news and et cetera, is that um, the left has, oh, this is a broad generalization, but I believe that, that the left and, and, you know, academia has always been pretty stern about this idea of the subjective world that you mentioned at some point, Aya, and, and how we cannot be objective in a subjective world, et cetera. Um, but, um, I think it was uh, Herzog, I, I don't remember who it was, but um, a, a German documentary filmmaker was saying, no, 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 you don't get it, there is a truth. Um, and, and what he meant by that is that when you say that the world is subjective as a whole, what ends up happening is what we have right now, right? Um, there is a truth, someone is guilty of killing someone or not. You know, someone can be innocent and be in jail. Someone can actually be racist. Someone can't, you know what I mean? Like, there are, there are points where we need to define what is, if, per, if perhaps not a commonly held truth, at least a vision that allows us to, to function in the world in a way that is um, coherent with our values. 
And I, I think when, even as designers, we say we still don't know what <coughs> success and failure is. Even if we don't know it, it's important that we start trying to define it. Because I, I believe this is not the time to, to, to jump around, you know, like, well, what is the truth and what is subjective and what is good? Because that's precisely what, um, I'm not going to say necessarily conservative, but the more extremist parts of, of conservative circles have, have held on to, right? Um, so, yeah, just kind of like a red herring. I still don't have an answer myself, but a red herring as to how you're treating the concepts uh, that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll just jump in. I, um, you know, I think we're we're all asking ourselves this question of, of like, what does meaningful impact look like? And kind of building on what Andy's talking about, um, when we talk about the role of the designer, I don't think that it needs to look or feel a certain way. Um, there's a need for multiple registers of approach um, and action, and. Um, I think that we need problem solvers, and we need those that open space for question, mm -hmm. questions. Uh, I recently saw uh, I'm Not Your Negro, the film uh, about James Baldwin. Uh, it's incredible. I, I, I highly recommend people see it. Um, but in it, he describes how he didn't want to join the Black Panthers because uh, he, he didn't feel all white men were evil. He didn't want to join the NAACP because uh, he felt there were socioeconomic hierarchies, um, and he felt apprehensive about taking part in marches uh, because he had spent so much time in Europe. Um, and he took responsibility instead for his role as witness. That's how he describes it. Um, and you know, because he's a Harlem-born expat, he occupies this unique position um, that allows a kind of critical distance um, that. Uh, that made his writings sort of uh, gave it this penetrating clarity. That you know, and so to, to not <coughs> worry about that, you know, the change should look a certain way, or that our role in that change should look a certain way, but to sort of reflect back and think, like, where do I belong to? People? I have a lot to say. <laughs> I think we should open it up for you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Experience. So, how does 
the, the characterization of design as led by designers actually creating visibility and isolation? And what can we do to change that language systematically in a way that can make it more inclusive and more accessible? Well, I, so I have a thought, which is that um, maybe going back to this idea that design is somehow neutral or apolitical, um, it, it's something that I hear a lot. And, um, and you know, we're a design firm, but we're not political. Right? And maybe it, it would do well to define politics, right? We're not talking about conservatism or liberalism. Um, well, perhaps, I mean, that's included, right? But um, fundamentally, we're also talking about power relations between citizens, uh, between the citizens and the state, right? And I think it's something that's very difficult to see when you occupy a privileged class, right? Um, you know, uh, as many designers do, um, your power becomes naturalized because um, and it, it then becomes invisible to yourself. And so for me, it's not a political act to walk down the street. Uh, for, for an immigrant, it is. Right? And I don't think this, the seemingly benign is in fact charged. Um, and so uh, when we talk about design thinking, we have, I think, um, we have this idea that it's a neutral set of frameworks. Um, and it's believed that whether these frameworks are used for good or for evil, is up to the ethical discretion of the practitioner. Right? And I believe, or I, I, I ask myself if, if this requires re-examination. Right? When we bring a toolkit to India, we are not simply bringing a benign object that outlines a more efficient means of approaching problems. <coughs> we are bringing an object inscribed with an ideology uh, that arose out of a very specific um, set of beliefs about how the world should be, right? Um, not dissimilar to the Bible, I'll admit. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't intend to be hyperbolic or combative. I know that many people here are deeply, deeply concerned with these questions and work hard to ensure that uh, we're not contributing to the history of colonization. But I think we also all know that having good intentions is not good enough, and that we have to really like step back and re-examine the structure that we're um, so, so, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for that question. I, oh my God, there's so much to that question. Um, the first thing is just what Sam said is completely correct, right? Like, it, same thing happens with technology. I'm in a technology firm, but doing this, you know, like, weird work. Um, but I'm in a technology firm, and the same thing has happened with technology all the time, right? Like, technology is neutral, blah, 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 and then we get Uber and no one gets to be able to live if they don't drive all day. Um, so, you know, these things can happen. Um, I think what I was really striving for with what I was saying was precisely that when we don't own up to, and I'm, I'm going to say politics here in, in, you know, the traditional sense when people think of like left and right instead of just power structures. When we don't own up to what our political views of the world are, whether you want to label them inside an ideology that has already been done by someone else like Marx before or not, what ends up happening is that it can be easily co-opted by anyone and anything, right? Um, so I, I actually think that saying, you know, we're going to India and we're thinking design thinking and not admitting that design thinking comes from this point of view is dangerous, but I also believe that not saying outright, like, this is why we're bringing it, so that the people that are receiving it can make their minds for themselves, whether they like it or not, is the most important thing. It's not, I'm just bringing design thinking, and I know it's politically complex. I think we should say, no, I'm bringing design thinking, and I acknowledge where it comes from, and I acknowledge that this is happening, and I acknowledge that the people that did it were in New York and are liberal progressives, um, you know, and this is who we are. Um, and I think there's some value to that, right? Um, as I said, there's also the possibility that it can be co-opted in the future. Most likely, I think it will be. <laughs> um, but I would strive for that. And then in, in my work with activists, um, 
it's just been, it's been so lonely. Like, I felt completely out of touch with what's happening on the streets. Uh, I've literally been told, you're making me feel like I don't know what I know. And that has been humbling. And I haven't done it by coming in and saying, this is what I think you should do, but rather just by doing a workshop. You know, doing a workshop and saying, but is that really the question? <laughs> literally, I've been told, you can't ask me if that's literally the question you wouldn't know. You know? Um, so, yeah, it's really complex. How have I dealt with it? Um, <coughs> trying to go together through a process of discovering what the truth is for both of us from the get-go. So one of the things that I've been pondering about is can we have, we have these things in tech called inceptions, which is when you come together with a client and you figure out what their needs are actually are. It's a workshop, right? Um, so I've been thinking about like, what does a political inception look like? Meaning, how do we come together, divine, what are we talking about when we talk about privilege? Well, how did we both analyze the election? Uh, you know, like, how are we analyzing the systems that we're living in together so that then we can speak on the same terms, um, which I, I don't think I had ever done before in, in a design workshop. You just came in and you were like, no, we're gonna get some insights, you know, from you, or we're gonna do them together, but we never talked about what is privilege, you know? It, it, it wasn't a part of the conversation, but I think in these conversations it is. I'm sorry that was long. I wanted to build on this question of the designer's identity, particularly in the context that I heard in the stories that you, Aya, and Andy shared about if we take sort of uh, these traditions of designers, and then also on the other hand, <coughs> entities working for change, activists, movements, NGOs, and sort of think of that in and of itself as a condition of transdisciplinarity. You have these different disciplines coming together. Um, I'm really curious about, given Clive's question on, does it, transdisciplinary designer need to announce him or herself as a designer. In your work, how have you seen um, the identity as designer in that transdisciplinary context when it's more visible or less visible? How does that impact the human dynamics among many different people working on a change project? Um, to sort of be able to work together better or to make sense of the world in the same way. It's like, how does announcing oneself as a designer inhibit or promote um, mutual understanding and the goals of the project? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, I'm young, we're all young. Um, I'm one year out of the program, so I would say that for a long time, I think I need to be just a listener. My role as a designer is to be a listener, especially that my work takes me to countries and contexts that um, I may think from my life experience that I may be able to understand, but I'm quickly understanding that I do not understand in fact. Um, and so a lot of the time, there's try, trying to navigate between um, working with people from different skills and backgrounds and trying to not step on um, what the, the space that they bring into the conversation by being a listener, but also trying to deal with the, there's a certain awkwardness when you are in context that you're not from. Um, and we're often, uh, I'm, I'm not Western, I'm Arab, but I'm often with Westerners, and so we come in as the white organization that's from New York. Um, and so it's, I'm still learning how to step um, on eggshells while also uh, gleaning and giving of myself as a designer and a listener. Um, in my case, it's, again, a humbling experience all around. Um, so I'm not from the U.S., I'm from Costa Rica, I was born and raised there. And, you know, that, that kind of gives me an in uh, with activists, where I'm already at least, I, I look super white, but the moment I, I say my last name, and then I, and literally I say my last name without an accent, it changes the room completely. So there's something definitely about being inside you know, the circles of trust, um, which I think is, is actually a, um, a very 
good way of defending diversity, but more as in like diversity as an actionable thing more than tokenism. Like it, it actually allowed me to do more as a designer to be a part of the group. Um, but um, I'm just paired up with activists a lot. And I've had to really realize that um, designers don't have that big a rep amongst activists. Um, they don't, like, they think we're graphic designers. Um, some of them know I do, actually, uh, which has been really good, because then I can say, like, I do. And then, and then I go, oh, I've heard about that. But there hasn't even been, like, a really, uh, uh, an awareness of, of what that is. So yeah. what I've had to do is really just, like, humbly sit down, pair with them, and say, what are the tools you already have? Because they already have a bunch of tools. And the first one that they always say is, when you come in, you better introduce yourself as to what your personal story has been of oppression and pain, which is really weird to say, um, so that they will trust you and not think that you're like just here to you know get the best of them. So I have to say, I grew up here. I was you know a gay rights activist. I did this and that and this and that. This is why I'm here. This is why I care about the work that we're doing. And and then there's an end. But, yeah. Do you have questions? Yeah, one. No, one more. This one is for Sam. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as, a, uh, as a teacher, how are you bringing sort of this viewpoint to new undergraduates <coughs> and people who are just sort of just becoming, just being able to call themselves? Um, well, I think like I said earlier, something that I run into is that um, we often think about design pedagogy as a set of steps um, or um, teaching a set of methodologies, uh, frameworks. And the best example I could give, it's like learning meditation, right? Where you sit cross-legged, and that's what meditation is, right? But it's not, and you, as you practice it more, you realize that you, know, you can walk around uh, the subway meditating, right? You don't need to sit cross-legged. And so the methods fall away, right? And so something I'm very interested in is the difference between methods and sensibility, right? and how we teach sensibility. And it's something that we cannot teach. Um, but I think that there are ways to nurture it. Um, but I think within the terms of our um, economy and you know, this age of quantification, the way we grade, um, it's very difficult to nurture it or to be incentivized to nurture it. I think that as designers, the first thing we should learn isn't Adobe Creative Suite. And this might sound a little uh, new agey, but I think that uh, the first thing we should learn is uh, like a meditation practice. Right? Because as a designer, everything comes out of the center. Right? And you, know, you can't serve others until you can serve yourself these kinds of ideas. Right? Um, when, and when we sit in a classroom, we are talking about these abstract ideas that have nothing to do with the embodied. Right? But we all experience this viscerality when we're walking around trying to do interviews in Harlem and being told to get the hell out of the neighborhood. Right? Which happened to me, which was a scarring experience and which made me question whether what I was doing was appropriate. And so you have to have that internal voice first before you can go out. And um, yeah, and I think all you can do is create a space in the classroom for, for that to be next. Okay, thank you, all of Woohoo! We're just taking great chance. So one last note for the break. Uh, some of you may have noticed we don't have any paper cups. This is because we've actually partnered with Vessel, 
a, uh, a service that's providing uh, uh, cups for uh, sustainable cups uh, for registration outside. So please make sure it's not and uh, we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you.